Last week we were up in tropical North Queensland, but we're heading west today to Mount Gibson Wildlife Sanctuary in the Wheatbelt region of Western Australia. It's about 300 kilometres northeast of Perth. As you know, AWC is a leader in carrying out reintroductions of locally extinct mammals into our network of large feral cat and fox free fenced areas. And we now manage eight of these fenced havens around the country, as well as 4A Island off the WA coast. And we've carried out hundreds of translocation operations, which have seen endangered mammal populations restored to these sites. But over the past couple of weeks, the AWC team at Mount Gibson has conducted a really important reintroduction, which is different to everything that we've done before. And joining us today to talk about this translocation outside the fence is Raquel Parker. Raquel's a field ecologist with AWC based at Mount Gibson. Thanks for joining us, Raquel. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're, you're very welcome. Thanks for, thanks for being part of this. Um, I'm interested to hear, Raquel, uh, where you are at Mount Gibson to start with. So can you describe to us where it's located and what the landscape is like at that sanctuary? Yeah, sure. So like you said, we're about um, 350k northeast of uh, Perth. Um, for people who aren't familiar or not too familiar with WA, if you imagine Perth um, and Geraldton, we sort of triangulate into the northeast. Um, and yeah, so we we sit between the Avon Wheatbelt and Yalgu Shire. Uh, we in botanical provinces, we we sit within a transition zone of the Aramean and Southwest botanical provinces. So we've got a very diverse uh, flora and you know wildlife out here. Um, yeah. Lots of mulga. We've got lots of woodlands like salmon gum and gimlets and, and york gum as well. It's uh, It sounds beautiful. So it's, it's arid zone, but there's actually quite large kind of forested and woodland areas too. So it's it sounds like an interesting transition between that really dry desert country further north and then the, the sort of woodlands in the southwest of WA. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, so if you imagine semi-arid, sometimes it's very, very dry, but we also do get some rainfall, periods of, of heavy rainfall as well. So beautiful uh, wildflower seasons as well when we do yeah. have heavy rains. It's, uh, I've seen some spectacular photos around September, October from, uh, from the southwest and especially that arid zone up around Mount Gibson. So the wildflowers there are, are really stunning. Um, and some of our listeners might have been up around that area for, for wildflower season. Now you've been at Mount Gibson for, was it three and a half years? Yeah, just over three years. Started here as an intern in 2018 um, and, yeah, transitioned into field ecologist and I've been here since. Fantastic. And uh, over that time, uh, as many of our listeners will be aware, Mount Gibson is actually the site of a, a major rewilding project, a, a mammal restoration project. Um, and so as, as part of that network of fenced areas with, you know, feral cat and fox-free uh, proof fences, um, can you just describe to us the scale of that fence at Mount Gibson? Yeah, sure. So basically Mount Gibson, the sanctuary itself is about 131, 132,000 hectares uh, and nearly 8,000 hectares of that is fenced. So the fence itself is about 44 kilometres um, around the perimeter. Uh, and within that we have lots of you know really good habitat for the species that we're reintroducing so we've got lots of uh, acacia area but also open woodland so yeah about 7,800 hectares of that is fenced. Right that's a, a really a massive scale um, and we're just seeing some video of that at the moment. Um, this landscape of the wheat belt in Western Australia has been impacted by you know habitat loss and, and degradation but as we can we can see in these images this section is, is very much intact, but there are species missing from here. So why was Mount Gibson a good location to carry out this kind of mammal restoration project? Yeah, so I like most of the, well, all of the sanctuaries that AWC have purchased and, and chosen as, as um, good locations for reintroductions. It was a cattle station um, before we purchased it, but it was never heavily stocked. 
So the habitat itself was degraded, but not to a point where it couldn't be restored. Um, so when we when we purchased it, we had some uh, surveys looking at what species were here before European times, and we would have had about 33 different mammal species. Unfortunately, we lost all of those. Um, and yeah, so the, the animals that we have selected to reintroduce were here before we purchased it. Um, and yeah, so yeah, that's, so yeah. For, for a lot of these species, they're things that, you know, quite often we see that pattern, and we've talked about this a lot of times before, that, uh, you know, foxes and cats were introduced early uh, after the colonisation of Australia. They spread very quickly across the arid zone, and quite often, you know, based on explorers' journals, but also um, anecdotal evidence and, uh, you know, traditional knowledge from Aboriginal people, the last records of some of these mammals are from, you know, the years immediately before foxes or cats arrived. So um, there's a, a number of species that, like you say, are missing from that Mount Gibson landscape. And it's essentially that size class of mammals. We talk about that critical weight range, things that are basically cat food size. Uh, anything within that size range is, is basically missing from the arid zone. And for some of them, they only survived on offshore islands. So, you know, the, the mainland populations went completely extinct, having to battle cats and foxes. Um, Bandit hair wallaby. Yeah, so th these are one of those species that only survived offshore. Um, and this is one that's been reintroduced at Mount Gibson. So have you been involved in, in working with that species? Yeah, absolutely. So the banded hair wallaby, um, I've been involved in some of the translocations from Bernier Island in the Shark Bay World Heritage Area uh, and Foray Island as well. Um, and yeah, so we did a couple of translocations from those for the banded hair wallaby in 2018 and 2019. Um, and we do some quite intensive monitoring of those species within the fenced area as well. Yeah, great. And, uh, you know, monitoring is important and we'll, we'll talk about the monitoring being done for the possum translocation shortly. Um, I just want to talk about some of the other species in there. So there are actually eight uh, reintroduced species now at Mount Gibson at various stages of becoming established. Um, and I believe that's a record for Australia. There are no other sites that have had so many species restored into a wild environment. Um, so, you know, some of the other things you see around uh, include numbats, I guess, and bilbies. What else is there? Yep, so we've got Western barred bandicoots or Shark Bay bandicoots, uh, formerly Western barred bandicoots, uh, greater stickness rats. We've got red-tailed fasca gales, uh, bilbies, uh, woilies as well. Um, and we should should mention now it was eight, but now we've reintroduced or at least released quite a few possums, so it's kind of nine. Yeah, um, yeah which is really exciting. Um, and here's one of those other species, the, the greater stickness rat, again, completely wiped out on the mainland, but survived, thankfully, on a couple of offshore islands where we've been able yeah. to source individuals and reintroduce them. Um, yeah, so we've, we've reintroduced those and we've done translocations from uh, South Australia. And they're doing quite well out here, actually. I'm I'm interested to hear how that has changed the experience of working at Mount Gibson. So, you know, three and a bit years ago, there must have been quite a, a lot fewer animals uh, when you started. Have you noticed that? Yeah, so when, when I started, I guess it was a really lucky time for me. I was quite lucky because the translocations had begun um, a few years before I started. But when I came on board, it was starting to get really heavily uh, into translocation season. So we, we translocated up to, I think it was seven species within a year. Um, and so, yeah, even just going out and radio tracking and trying to follow these banded hair wallabies, it was rare to see a number. Um, but now if you drive through the exposure, you can see several of them each morning. Um, and same thing with spotlighting at night. If you drive through the exposure, it was, you know, you're lucky to see a woolly or two back in 2018. And now it's pretty much guaranteed you'll see woolies and bilbies and even bandicoots, which is really, really exciting. Um, that's, that's so cool to hear. And um, yeah, yeah for, for you and the team living out there, you're, you're literally working within this landscape full of mammals, um, which is we imagine what Australia would have been like prior to European colonisation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's, it is. It's really beautiful. And 
being able to take supporters and, and volunteers and visitors spotlighting through the explosion now, it's, it's even more rewarding um, being able to share that with people who just don't get the chance to see them in everyday life out here. It's, you know, it's our day to day. So yeah, it's um, really... I'm very jealous. Um, and if people are interested in volunteering, I'll just mention too that we've got a, a very active volunteer program. So you can find our volunteer portal at our website, australianwildlife.org. Um, and if you register there, you'll actually get sent out invites uh, or you know opportunities to volunteer across all of our sanctuaries. Um, so you know that might be a, an opportunity for people to get involved and you know get out into the, some some of these areas. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah, encourage people to do that if they're if they're keen on volunteering. Absolutely. A lot of what we do, we rely heavily on volunteers as well. So it's, you know, it's rewarding for them. It's rewarding for us to so get involved. Great. So we've talked about reintroductions and how, you know, we're essentially rebuilding this mammal fauna at Mount Gibson back to what it would have been like historically. Um, but of course, that's only within that fenced area of, uh, well, what's the size of the fenced area at Mount Gibson? Um, to start with? Yep, 7,800 hectares of fenced mm -hmm. area. Yep. Right, so all of these reintroductions that we've been talking about have taken place into that safe haven uh, where there's very low, well, there's zero risk of predation from cats and foxes, but there are, of course, yep. still na native predators, goannas and, and eagles and things like that. Um, but AWC's goal has always been to extend these rewilding projects beyond the limits of these fenced areas. And I guess to get to that point, we've had to do a lot of work to understand how foxes and cats use the landscape, how we might be able to measure their density, their activity, uh, how they move around and, and reinvade after we've done control of them. And I'm interested in how that work has been applied now at Mount Gibson. So, you know, this work beyond the fence to, to find out how feral predators are moving around. What has been the approach taken at Mount Gibson? Uh, yeah, so in 2019, uh, we initiated the Feral Predator Ecology Project at Mount Gibson. Uh, and basically that's, we have about 20,000 hectares of a camera array. Um, we originally started with 20,000 hectares and it's extended since then. So we've got 90 cameras out uh, about 1.5 kilometres apart, uh, and that's outside of the fence. So what that's looking at is measuring the activity of cats and foxes outside of the fence. Um, and that covers an area that we aerial, aerially bait with uh, eradicate. So that's looking at controlling cats and foxes um, with, with the baits. And then we also have a comparison area of a, a camera array, which is at the southern end of the exclosure, which isn't baited. So we look at the, the changes in cat and fox activity um, and the effectiveness of our control measures with the baiting to you know, ensure animals that we are reintroducing beyond the fence now and into the future are able to survive with cats and foxes in the landscape just at a, you know, at a controlled number. Yeah. Have you got some corellas in the background, Raquel? I can hear some. Um... Uh, red tail cockatoos. Ah, nice. <laughs> Fantastic. I've just got carawongs yeah. and lorikeets here. Um, okay, so the, these camera trap arrays have been set up. It sounds like a you know big experiment where you've got a treatment area and a control area so that you can really compare what's going on with cats and foxes in each of those areas. And yeah. the sort of information you're getting, does that allow you to, to get you know, robust activity measurements? Uh, yes, it does. It is still early stages. Um, so even though it went out in 2019, uh, the, the cameras are out for quite a period of time. Well, they're out indefinitely at the moment, but we check them every couple of months. Um, so we do run the activity index on that to look at changes in activity. But because we bait annually, uh, we have only baited once. So it's not really ready to report on in terms of the changes in the activity, but it will as as you over the years, um, it will give us a more robust sort of, you know, measurement of changes in activity as a result of baiting. Yeah, and I think you know the important point there is that we're actually measuring everything that's going on out there, so we'll have a good idea of what's happening to cat and fox uh, numbers and activity. 
um, because of this, you know, this infrastructure that we've put in, essentially these big arrays of camera traps. So it's it's very intensive monitoring based on work that has gone before um, for, for cat and fox ecology research. Um, yep. And at the same time, that's, you know, that aerial baiting across a large scale has given us confidence to go ahead and carry out the first reintroduction outside the fence. So we might come to that next. Um, and this has been happening over the last couple of weeks. Um, do you want to tell us what the first species was, where it came from, um, and just about a couple of those translocations that have happened? Sure. So yeah, a couple of weeks ago, we, we reintroduced our first species beyond the fence, which was the brush-tailed possum. Um, for people listening, I'm sure people are wondering why we reintroduced the brush-tailed possum. Um, so they have, they were widespread across Western Australia. Unfortunately, now they're, they've um, deteriorated across lots of their semi-arid natural home range. So we reintroduced them inside the fence and outside the fence. Um, the first uh, uh, batch, I guess you would say, came from Krakenmeyer, which was our first AWC wildlife sanctuary. The second ones came from Dryandra in the Southwest. And we successfully have reintroduced 39 individuals uh, and we have some more coming in the next couple of weeks. Were you involved at both ends, both, you know, catching them uh, at those source populations and release or just at Mount Gibson? I was on the release end for the possums when the trapping team catch the animals and they check the health and uh, transport them here. We have a look at them. We check their overall health when they get here. We check their collars because some of them have VHF or GPS collars so we can follow them and monitor their dispersal and their survival. Um, and then we take them out to some pre-selected hollows based on um, some good habitat. So summer gum and york gum and we release them out there uh, in the evenings. So. Right, and that, that's literally just happened, you know, in the last, well, two sessions, but one was just a week ago, wasn't it? Yes, yes, that was the Dryandra, Dryandra translocation, yeah. And uh, people are immediately on the question line asking how are they going? So you're obviously monitoring these animals regularly. Um, yep. What's involved in monitoring? And can you tell us anything about the movements from these first couple of weeks? Yeah, so for the animals, um, like I said, we had 39 individuals. Uh, 11 of them have uh, radio tracking collars on them. For the individuals that aren't collared, we have lured camera traps at their release locations. So, you know, peanut butter balls where they come in and they have a sniff and we're able to sort of monitor them. Um, and for the ones with the collars, we radio track them every day to their source location. So we're actually able to follow them around to the exact hollow and the exact tree that they're in. Um, they're all doing really well. Uh, within their home, like within the same area, some of them have moved about a K or two two kilometres even, um, and some of them are sort of moving between two very distinct locations, so two, two of the same trees. So yeah, we're able to monitor them daily and yeah, they're all doing really well. That's that's so good to hear. Um, early days, obviously, but uh, that-, that Early days, up. yeah. Mm. And that will be ongoing. So we'll, we'll keep you up to date with how those possums settle in. And there's a, a further translocation to go, is that right, from another site? Yes, one more translocation from Perup for right. this year, and then next year we'll also do some more translocations to supplement the population. And you mentioned that you actually pre-selected hollows for them to go into. Um, I've mm -hmm. got some footage here of, of one of them. So did that involve kind of surveying for hollows across the whole release area, or you know, how did you pick those sites? Yeah, so there's been vegetation surveys across the whole sanctuary. So before animals were selected to be reintroduced. Um, we considered the habitat and what was the best sort of habitat for which species. Uh, and we would go out to salmon gum woodlands and the York gum woodlands and look for hollows because it's the best habitat for them. Um, it just, yeah, involved walking around and looking and seeing, making sure there's enough hollows for several different individuals in each area and, and yeah, releasing them they're hoping that they could find a nice little home and settle in. That's it's fantastic and a really important step in our goal to rebuild populations, not just within these fenced havens, but outside the fence as well. Um, so yeah, great to hear about all of this work, Raquel. Soon I think we'll come to some questions. So if you have a question that you'd like answered, please type it in the Q&A. 
Uh, we've got some that people have sent in already. Thank you for those. Um, people are asking about the monitoring that happens post release and just the different techniques you've got. So you mentioned uh, lured cameras and uh, and different sorts of collars. Do you want to just talk about those again? Yeah. So for different species, the monitoring techniques are different. Um, so for the woilies, say. Um, we're able to just put out some traps with a peanut butter ball in them and they will, they're very trap happy. We're able to catch them. Um, we put microchips in, so we monitor them over the years. Um, for other animals, it's not so easy. And a lot of what we're doing is actually research based. So we're trying to figure out the best ways to monitor them. Um, so we do things like uh, scat plot surveys. So we clear certain areas uh, and go back several weeks later and count how many different scats there are from different species. Um, we have traps in trees, we radio track. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different techniques, but I think the, the take home message from this is that it's still a work in progress for a lot of animals um, to actually get decent monitoring techniques and, and robust estimates of populations. Um, so yeah, so numbats, we do drive surveys where we, we literally just look and spot and measure the distance between ourselves and, and where the animal is, um, yep. spotlight survey. There's lots of different, yeah, monitoring techniques. That would keep you busy with eight or, or nine Very busy, uh, yep. to keep track of, yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. A another question here is about genetics and whether, you know, prior to these releases, we actually, uh, do genetic analysis to to set up those populations in a genetically healthy way. Is that part of this? Work? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So before we do any reintroductions, we we come up with a proposal and we look at um, the best genetics and where we can, how we can mix those genetics to make sure we do uh, contribute to the gene pool and, uh, you know, give them the opportunity for the, you know, the best self-sustaining population. Um, so yeah, the source locations that we translocate animals from are selected based on where the best genetics of these species are. So definitely. Yeah, and uh, we've actually now got an in-house geneticist working on a lot of those reintroductions and threatened species, you know, management plans, uh, which is you know bringing a whole a whole new level of, I guess, rigor to to the theory behind each of these reintroductions. Um, a really interesting question here about why possums were chosen for outside the fence reintroductions. So is it to do with how robust they are and their size? Um, what was the thinking behind choosing those rather than say bilbies or woilies for an outside the fence release? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I guess the aim of the restoration project is to restore these species um, to their, you know, pre-European um, existence. So the the possum is a, a boreal species. Um, it's there's a bit of an assumption that it may, after being reintroduced in the fence, may be able to uh, exit if it if it likes. Yeah. Um, so I guess the the idea behind the reintroduction inside and outside the fence is the focus isn't just on reintroducing in the fence. It's the whole sanctuary itself. So um, the possum was chosen as the outside arboreal species. Um, it is historically, while it's not a threatened species, like the number and the bilbies that aren't able to exist with cats, which is why they're inside the fence, it has existed with cats and foxes in the landscape. Um, so we do need to continue to control the cats and foxes, but uh, we're pretty confident that the, or very confident, I should say, that the possum will be able to establish a self-sustaining population outside the fence. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I guess that point you made that it's not one of those listed threatened species um, means that you know the stakes are a bit lower working with an animal like that that we know has been able to hold on in a lot of its historical range, although it's declined from from some areas. Um, a really good question there. Thank you for that one. Uh, okay, an, an interesting question here about the density of hollows. So um, this person is asking about you know, there are lots of birds that use hollows for nesting, cockatoos and parrots and things like that. And is there, you know, is there a shortage of hollows in these landscapes and will possums pose competition to some of those nesting birds? I mean, it's, it's a really good question, potentially. After the reintroduction of these species, obviously we're going to monitor and look at the, um, 
you know, the effects that it has on the landscape and, and on the, in, uh, the ecosystems and the systems that are in place. There's, I wouldn't say that there's a shortage out here. We have some beautiful, vast woodlands um, with lots and lots of hollows. And I guess an important, again, message to take home is that the possums were here. Hmm. Um, we're reintroducing them. So it's, while they haven't been here for many, many years, they were part of the ecosystem beforehand. So it, yeah, there may be competition to a degree, um, but it's a natural state, so. That's right. And, you know, yeah, cockatoos and possums must have had those arguments, you know, a <laughs> hundred years Back ago. Back in the right. day, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, that's that's a really interesting um, angle. So, yeah, good question again. Uh, yeah, another good question. question. Another question here about um, other species that might be released outside the fence. So th this is, you know, potentially the first step in rewilding beyond fenced areas, um, mm -hmm. by AWC at least. And are there plans for further reintroductions of other species at Mount Gibson in an unfenced landscape? Yeah, so as part of the restoration project, the 10th species is the Chudich or the Western Quoll. And um, so the plan for the Western Quoll to be reintroduced hopefully in is in place for 2022. Yeah, so next year we're, we'll be looking at that and that'll be really interesting because um, for those who know what a quoll is, the, the predators, so it'll be a very interesting um, species to monitor, particularly with cats and foxes in the in the landscape as it is, yeah. Yeah, that's um, that will be a really exciting one. And it's one that uh, I think we've recorded Western quolls at Peruna in the Southwest, where, you know, we've been looking after yep. that sanctuary really well for a long time. So they've, they seem to have moved back into that area. Um, but like so many things, they've declined from the arid zone this will be the first uh, intentional reintroduction by AWC um, and joining the possums outside the fence. So yeah, I'd love to hear more when, when we get closer to that qual release about how that's going. Um, yep. We've got time for just a couple more questions here. So uh, if anyone has burning questions, um, I've actually got a lot here that we won't get through, but, but thank you everyone for your, your great questions in this session. A very interesting question again, just about uh, whether the animals inside. So you mentioned that possums are expected to be able to get out of the fence. Uh, and some people might be aware that we actually do see leakage of some of these species outside the fence. So as yep. you know, they're designed to keep cats and foxes out, but they're not necessarily designed to keep all of our reintroduced populations in. Um, have mm -hmm. you noticed other species able to get out of outside of the fence? And, and what do you think is their fate? Yeah, um, so one of the really exciting things about having these feral predator cameras out there to monitor the cats and foxes is that we actually see uh, the other species that are outside of the fence. Um, and as you said, the fences are designed so the cats and foxes can't get in, but some species have leaked out. Uh, we've got detections of some woilies outside the fence. Um, we've actually had a number and a couple of bilbies and some bandicoots. Uh, and we've been monitoring them as well for over a year. So it's really, it's a positive thing to see. And I guess something to, to keep in mind is that being able to leave the fenced area is, is a opportunity for, I guess, population regulation. Um, so if, you know, we've got a lot of woilies in there, being able to have numbers exit the fence means that the animals inside the fence and the population inside the fence are able to regulate um, and there's less competition. Sure, and, and so, I guess yeah. you know, the dispersal is part of their ecology. So, you know, at, we know that Australian animals go through that boom and bust cycle, there are peaks and troughs in population. We would expect them to be moving out, you know, beyond that area in natural circumstances. So, so that's healthy. I guess, you know, the question is with cats and foxes out there, you know, are they likely to persist or do you think we'll need more intensive control to have woilies and numbats in the long term outside of fenced areas? Yeah, so I mean, with everything, there's there's going, there's going a need for control. Um, we have monitoring surveys, different types of surveys outside the fence as well. Uh, so we'll be able to monitor the populations uh, and part of the feral predator ecology project is looking at the effectiveness of our baiting and is that enough to be like reduce the numbers of cats and foxes for these animals to be able to persist. Mm -hmm. But like I said, some of those woilies that we were detecting back in 2019 uh, were you know, within a kilometre or two from the fence area. 
but now we're actually detecting them several k's, you know, up to 10 kilometers from the fenced area. And we're seeing woilies with pouch young, woilies with young at heel, uh, woilies carrying nest matter. So they look like they're persisting. I can't say, you know, much more than that, um, but we will yeah. be doing more monitoring outside the fence to look at how those populations are going. Yeah, that's, that's very exciting. Yeah, cool. Um, great. Okay, I think I'll I'll choose one or two more here. Um, oh yeah, this is a, something that we haven't touched on yet. And just talking about the baiting that we've been doing. So that's using Eradicat you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. And there's actually a, the situation in Southwest WA where a lot of native mammals, native wildlife, has a very high tolerance of that chemical. Do you want to talk through that yeah. situation and, and why we're confident using that um, that particular bait to target cats and foxes? Yeah, so the species here have evolved um, with the chemical that's taken and used in the 1080 bait. Mm. Uh, so they're less, uh, they're more tolerant to to the 1080 bait. So even if they do consume some of it, um, they're able to persist and survive. Whereas some of the, the species more over in the East and um, yeah, in different countries that use 1080 bait aren't as uh, tolerant to, to the chemicals. So yeah, while, while we use it out here, we're, we're pretty confident and that the, the threatened species are able to survive even though we are dropping baits and it's just mainly taken up by cats as well. Mm. Yeah, and interesting too that um, baiting is being used for cats there because I know, you know, as live prey specialists, that's not always an effective way of, of controlling them. But, you know, perhaps in the arid zone and especially at dry times, they are more willing to take baits. Any insight on yeah, that? Yeah, there's lots of techniques used and there's a lot of research that's gone into uh, the bait dropping, uh, the aerial uh, prescription of the baits and the uptake of, of the baits by cats and foxes. So, for example, when the baits are dropped, they're, they're, they go through a process of sweating first, which makes them um, quite soft and palatable to a cat and the oils leak from it. Um, whereas if they're dropped when they're hard or, you know, if it's too wet or too cold, it's just like a cold sausage and the cat's less likely to, to, to ingest it. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot that goes into the planning and the, the actual baiting process. So the timing is crucial. You know, the, the weather is crucial. The preparation is crucial, mm. um, but yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so, and this will be the final question, but you know, people who want to get involved in this sort of work or do this for a job, you know, it sounds like a, a wonderful job working with all of these threatened species populations. Um, Raquel, how did you get into this role as an ecologist? Um, yeah, so I studied zoology, uh, majoring in ecology, and I applied for the internship with AWC, and I've never looked back. So, yeah. Excellent. And, uh, yeah, we've got a, a very active internship program as well. So for, for young graduates or, you know, people who are uh, looking for a career change where they can, um, you know, spend some... Yeah, I had a career change, so you don't have to be young. I... <laughs> I did my internship at 30, so go for it. It doesn't matter what age you are. Oh, good one. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've actually graduated almost 100 people through that internship program as of this year. Um, it's become a, a wonderful way for us to engage with the best and brightest young, eco sorry, young uh, emerging ecologists. Um, and, you know, and a lot of our ecologists have, have come through that program. So it's a, a really a, a, a great way of us um, you know, working with, with some of Australia's best ecologists, like you, Raquel. Thank you for telling us all about this project. Thank you, Jerry. And um, I've got a, another little clip of that possum release that happened last week, which I'll just share with you now. Um, and we, we wish the possums all the best. So good luck with tracking them over the next little while um, as they settle in at Mount Gibson. Thank you. That one's a bit tentative. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us once again. Um, I hope you've enjoyed hearing about this work and uh, you know it, it is a really significant step for AWC to be doing these reintroductions outside the fence. Um, we hope that you know it paves the way for a future for these species outside of fenced havens and in the wider landscape because really our vision is for an Australia that's full of these mammals you know full of 
wild, healthy populations of wildlife. If you've yeah. been inspired by this work, um, and if you're, you're not already a supporter, or if you're looking to, to make a donation, I'd encourage you to take part in our $3 million match challenge. It means that any donations which are eligible, so over $500, will be matched. So you can actually increase the impact of your donation if you give as part